Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Liberty.me Live. Uh, tonight we're here with author Tracy Lawson to celebrate the release of her new science fiction thriller, Counteract. Uh, this book, which is uh, swimming in positive reviews on Amazon.com, has been compared to the very successful Hunger Games and Divergent series of novels. In terms of it uh, being a dystopian thriller that's focused on characters who are coming to terms with the reality of their world. The protagonists, uh, Tommy and Kareem, they start the story as law-abiding citizens in a crazy uh, United States 2034. They live in a full-blown coercive terror state. The population lives on lockdown for the most part. Like There aren't grocery stores. There's no football games. Everybody's locked down for their own safety. And uh, the main characters start out as obedient model citizens and strangers to one another. But uh, over the book, they transform and they become more and more closely connected together as they come to understand more about the reality of their world. Uh, for those of you who are new to the platform, uh, I should mention that you can uh, chat informally in the bottom right as uh, Frank and Reagan and everybody else are doing already. And if you have a question uh, for uh, Tracy tonight that you want to make sure we catch and we don't miss, you can put it up in the top right in the Q&A box. So there's kind of a trade-off between like instant gratification messaging in the chat box on the bottom and then the Q&A questions where you, you know we're going to see it, but we're going to see it later on in the program. Uh, so Tracy, I want to tell everybody a little bit about Tracy herself before I, I turn the program over to her. Tracy ha herself has her degree from Ohio University, and a fun tidbit is that she actually studied with Daniel Keyes, who's the author of Flowers for Algernon. Uh, she's already published two uh, nonfiction books. I think this is her first fiction uh, entry. Uh, the, uh, one of the books is an award-winning uh, account of a historical journey that her uh, a historical journey from Ohio to New York City, taken by. Let me see if I can get it right. Her great, great, great grandfather. Did, did I get the right number of greats in there, Tracy? <laughs> and uh, the other book is actually a collection of stories by 61 different people that Tracy kind of organized and uh, brought together, and that's called Given Moments. Uh, all right, Tracy, welcome to Liberty.me Live. We're looking forward to hearing about your new novel, Counteract, and the kind of libertarian thinking that informed it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try this with the PowerPoint tonight, and start. I'm going to start off with, um, there's the cover of the book. And moving on to this wonderful quote from Jeff Tucker. When the real dystopia arrives, it will be chosen by the people out of fear of something even worse. And that was a great thing to start me off on my, uh, my journey here when my book was, re was released back in August, um, talking about Counteract. It's book one in a series, and um, here's the, the premise. In 2034, we live with the constant threat of terrorism. Um, the Office of Civilian Safety and Defense has carefully crafted a list of civilian restrictions designed to protect the public against attacks. And the, the OCSD was created in 2019, and it encompasses all the safety and security forces, um, the, the OSHA, the TSA, pretty much everything. If somebody says all the A's are now included in the OCSD, and, and basically the director of the OCSD wields more power than the president. Um, under these restrictions, citizens in carefully monitored quadrants, um, there's no travel, no social media, no, no concerts or sporting events, and, and no cash transactions. Only a select few are permitted to own cars and drive, and the OCSD has even all outlawed grocery stores, all in the name of safety. Now, when I was working on this book, I was having coffee with a friend, and I was telling her about this scene I had written where they banned grocery stores. And, of course, her first response was, oh, great, I don't have to schlep my groceries home any longer. They'll just be delivered straight to me. And I said, yes, but what if you don't get to choose what you eat? What if they decide for you, this is what you need for 21 meals this week? And, and then what happens when the cost spirals out of control and you don't have extra money to eat out in restaurants and, and the economic breakdown that would come from that? The people who live in restaurants or work in restaurants and who work in food service and who work in food distribution, that would lose their job. And these are the kind of things that these safety organisms that people think are a great idea, they don't necessarily help the economy overall. And that's kind of one of the illustrations in the book. Okay, so we've got all these restrictions in place because localized terrorist attacks are commonplace in this world. Uh, but now there's a new threat, and it could actually um, take out anybody in the country at any time. It's airborne chemical weapons that could be activated and detonated um, over and over if necessary. 
but the OCSD has an antidote ready and waiting because they've anticipated this, anti this attack. They had intel and they knew. So now everybody must go and get their, their um, dosage of the antidote that will protect them. And just three drops a day will keep them safe. And as always, they say it's a small price to pay for your safety. But is it, is the question. Um, so Tommy and Kareem, like, like um, Mike was saying, they are law-abiding citizens. They, you know, they've grown up with these restrictions. They're both 18 years old, and the restrictions have been in place since they were about three. So obviously, they wouldn't think to question this kind of thing. So when when the uh, the announcement comes and oh my gosh, there's a new terrorist threat, line up quick, get your your antidote. Um, Kareen right away goes to the student center at her university and stands in line. Tommy is um, he's a little bit more reluctant to go because he's just been recovering from a car accident that killed his parents and left him um, with some severe injuries. And he's just battled his way back to feeling a little bit normal again. And then he wakes up to this news and he says, gosh, again, I have to decide whether I want to live or die again. And uh, my third protagonist who starts off as kind of a bad guy is the quadrant marshal, Wes Carraway. And he's paying a visit to his brother down in a remote quadrant in the, in the hill country, and, and his brother tells him how this is, this is, you know, it stinks. This whole thing seems like a conspiracy. And Wes, who's been sent to the Quadrant Marshall Academy, and he's working for the government, he says, you know, you, maybe you need to take this. And, and his brother says, I'm not taking this. And so Wes kind of has, is torn because he's taken the antidote, and he sees no problems with it. And so what they learn and they discover as the story goes along is, um, you know, is the crux of Counteract. So um, Counteract in the subsequent books tell the story of this enemy among us that kind of snuck up on everybody and under the guise of protecting them, kind of turned this whole nanny state that we kind of live in now into more of a police state without anybody noticing. Um, after decades of dealing with terrorism, uh, security has become an obsession and, and uh, everybody is so worried about being safe that they don't really care what restrictions are um, set upon them. And when I wrote Counteract, um, I don't want to go into too many spoilers, but when I wrote Counteract, I started off wanting to tell an exciting story. Um, and a lot of you know that I'm married to Bob Lawson, who's an economist and who's also big in the liberty movement. And, um, you know, Bob, when he writes, he can be all about the numbers. But when I watch him speak, it's the anecdotal stuff in his work that really forges connections with his students or with his audience. And when I started off to write a novel and write a thrilling story for young adults and teenagers, um, I guess I naturally gravitated toward the anecdotal, you know, the liberty movement, the anecdotal, you know, watching out for the government and, and being a responsible person who was aware of what was going on around them. And so when I told this story, as you can see, um, you know, the, the kids in this live in a world where the events that don't seem to affect them directly can have a huge impact on their futures. And that's every kid. That's not just the kids in the story. So I hope that everybody who reads Counteract will not only enjoy an exciting story, but, you know, recognize the importance of questioning what they're told and, and not uh, giving up their, uh, their liberties just because somebody is well-meaning and says it's a great idea. They should really, you know, take a stand for their own and take responsibility for their rights. Um, so with, I'm going to go into a little bit more of just dystopian fiction because this has kind of been in the news lately with an article published in The Guardian by Ewan Morrison and then a response by Sarah Squire. Now um, Morrison says every teenager is a rampant individualist and a libertarian at heart, but he meant it in a bad way. And of course Sarah responded with young adult fiction pokes holes in the pieties of the most important authority figures in the lives of young people. And I think that's always been the case for dystopian fiction and, and teen because, um, you know, they explore the hopes and the fears of its readers. And the genre resonates with teens because they're interested in exercising their own rites of passage. They're interested in having autonomy growing up. And um, in the world of Counteract, not only are the teenagers not allowed to grow up, the adults are not allowed to grow up either. Yes, I agree with Mike um, that so when Morrison said that, it was like, oh, that was a good thing. But I don't, I did, I don't know if he meant it as a good thing or not. Um, 
because you know the dystopian genre it's a twisted version of perfection and of course it's masquerading as the utopia stable peaceful carefully structured and no pain or risk protagonists are set apart because they dare to question or reject the norms of society and eventually their dissatisfaction and curiosity uh, um, are revealed in an attempt to you know to be free and the society structure is what tries to destroy humanistic attitudes and desires like curiosity, creativity, innovation, and hope for the future. And there's an awful lot of young adult dystopia out there now that is reflective of these, these ideas. Um, but I want to talk about a couple classics, uh, like The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. And I don't think I'll ever forget reading The Lottery for the first time. I was probably in junior high. And we saw the 1969 film, and it was very frightening to me. And at the time, I thought, how? How could they let something like this happen? How could adults let this annual slaughter, this annual human sacrifice happen in, uh, in modern times? But then as you grow up, you start to realize that it's really not all that far-fetched that we let things happen. And uh, we recognize that it's, you know, it's not all that hard to convince people that what's happening is the best way or the only way to do things. Um, I felt like when I reread the lottery, it was really a forerunner uh, for the Hunger Games. And then, of course, um, the other one that makes sense is Anthem by Ayn Rand, which you know is set in the future, dark age, characterized by irrationality and collectivism and the socialistic thinking and economic policies that have led them back to that dark age. And, um, but I really felt for the, the main character, the protagonist, Equality 72521, because of his curse, his um, transgression of thought, transgression of preference, and um, his eagerness to think and learn, and his unwillingness to give up on himself, or to give himself up for others, which, you know, is the collective way. And uh, the things that he was told as a child that he was evil because he had grown taller than his brothers. Um, but he couldn't do anything about that. And it's not good to be different, but it's evil to be superior. And we don't want that kind of thought to be OK. Um, I think it's important to use fiction to give truth, because it's a lot more people are a lot more receptive to an exciting story that happens to share a truth than they are with, you know, a, dry, a nonfiction or a dry a recitation of what we should be doing. But if you give it to them as, as fiction, then people will go, oh my gosh, and it'll still start to reflect on it and hopefully will entertain them while making them think. Um, I have a list of suggested young adult dystopian books that I've enjoyed, and this is really a a very short list, but we can, uh, you know, you can start from there. And I, I hope that a lot of you guys have read a lot of these. And then also suggested classics. Um, on my blog, I compare a classic with a young adult dystopian and talk about how, you know, similarities and things like that. One thing you might not think about, like com comparing Fahrenheit 451 with Matched by Ali Condi, which at first glance, they don't seem to have a whole lot in common, but they actually did. Oh, and yeah, Mike, The Handmaid's Tale. Very, very disturbing, but also very, very cool. And um, if you compare that with Bumped by Megan McCafferty, um, Bumped is, it, there's been a, a virus, a pandemic, and all the adults are sterile. And the only, like 80% of the kids are going to be sterile by the time they're 18 years old. And so the whole society's um, opinion of teen pregnancy, and kids are encouraged to quote unquote bump as often as they can with as many different people as they can, so that they procreate as often as they can and keep society going, which is also kind of disturbing when you're the mom of, of a daughter and you think about, oh my goodness, you know, they're encouraging kids from the age of 12 on to, uh, to go ahead and, and bump, and this, this young girl whose parents are economists is um, She's the first professional bumper. She's got a contract for, I think it's 100 grand, a new car, 
her college education and a tummy tuck are paid for if she just gives her first offspring to this uh, couple. And they've even found a stud for her. And he's uh, apparently he's all that. And she's been saving herself. She hasn't bumped like the other kids. And she's been saving herself because she's secretly in love with her best guy friend, who's not really bump worthy because he may not be tall, strong, and good looking. And so she's torn, you know, because her folks have, have figured out this whole system to beat the system. But she also kind of would like to be in love. And it's, it's a really interesting story. And of course, things get complicated when her. Um, her long lost identical twin shows up on her doorstep. So it, it's a very fun read. Um, Megan McCafferty did a great job of creating this world with all of its uh, social media and its teen slang and everything all turned on its head so that your baby bump was the most, uh, was your best attribute, was the sexiest thing that you had. And, uh, and so again, comparing that with Handmaid's Tale was kind of, uh, was fun because the YA dystopian Sometimes it's a little bit lighter. It's more like being in high school. Um, there's maybe more hope at the end of some of the books. And so I think that they're a great preparation for readers to, uh, to take a look at those before they tackle the classics. So let's see what else I have here. And then I've got some links for buying and links for finding other things, uh, links to my blog. Um, follow the Resistance series on Twitter. The second book, Resist, is due out next year. and um, I, does anybody have any questions? Here I am. There you go. I'm coming back momentarily. You'll be able to see my amazing <laughs> face in him. <laughs> there you go. Oh, wow, Tracy. Uh, uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I was going to say I don't have any I don't have anything to drink. If I have to do shots now because you were missing, I don't know. I I, I don't have anything in front of me, so I could call Bob and see if he Quickly, <laughs> Yeah, Bob, um, bring me a drink. <laughs> uh, no, I Frank, you're not alone you. now. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know what else we got. I'd love a fireball, but hey. Um. <laughs> so. Uh, well, uh, while we're waiting for, for Bob to pour you a drink here, um, I, I wonder, uh, I'm, I'm going to just start with questions off the top. I've actually got one from Frank uh, where he mm -hmm. asks, have you uh, read or have you been influenced by uh, the science fiction author Douglas Adams? No, not at all. Here I go. Jeez, <laughs> oh, don't go anywhere again, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, every time you say no to a question, by the way, every time your answer is short, you have to take a shot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we try not to tell you all the rules up front. It can't be overwhelming. It'll get goes too quickly. Yeah, I checked the box that said I agree to the terms and conditions, but I didn't read it, so. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, uh, Tyler Lloyd um, asks uh, about the challenges you face. He said, what are some of the challenges in creating uh, your collectivist dystopia? What are, what are the challenges in kind of putting it together? Wow. Um, the government keeps stealing my stuff. That's my biggest challenge. When I started writing this book <laughs> a half years ago, I thought a lot of this stuff was so far out. And every time I turn on the news, I'm like, dang it. Quit stealing my stuff. So yeah, that's, that's probably one of the biggest challenges is coming up with something that's intense enough because of what's going on. You know. It's wow. Well, like stop the giving them ideas, uh, Tracy. <laughs> they keep stealing your material. Yeah, it's like. Uh, do you have a specific example of that, where something that you you kind of put together? Um. <laughs> I'm now, of course, a, a specific example is going to escape me, but, um, <laughs> oh, let's see. Let, let me think on that. Um, I, did, I did refer back to some of my days working for a, a state agency at the beginning of the book when they're lining up and they're, they're going through the, uh, the DNA swab and all that stuff to get the, and, and the lines that they have to wait in to get their initial dose of the antidote. And while they're waiting, 
um, there's a couple that the, the man says, well, what's in it? My wife's pregnant. I don't want her to take anything unless we know it's safe, unless we know it's okay. And because he's questioned the, the people in authority, he's actually dragged out of the room. He and his wife are escorted out. And after that, nobody asks any questions. But when uh, Kareem's in the line and somebody in front of her says something really stupid and she kind of explodes and she says, what, what are you even saying? And the girl says, oh, I, so I assume you're an authority on terrorism. Look, everybody, she's an authority on terrorism. Well, by the time Kareem gets up to the line, sh she's been flagged. Her file's been uh, marked as uh, to be watched. And just simply someone speaking up and saying, hey, she's, you know, oh, she's an authority on terrorism. And just being snide. And sometimes I wonder if that doesn't occur from time to time, but yes. Um, and at the agency where I worked in the state of Florida, if we had an issue with a file, we put a red dot on the front of the, of the file and, and Kareem gets a red dot. So I, uh, the folks down at, at the uh, bar examiners in Florida may recognize that if anybody reads it down there. But that's, uh, that's, a, nice, that's a nice simple uh, detail um, and makes it real. Um, Jeffrey Tucker uh, is wondering about uh, film. Uh, he says, I was just looking through the movies the last five years and trying to decide which of those movies are most liberty oriented. And he wonders, do you have your own opinions on this question? Like, which are the most liberty oriented movies coming out recently? Wow, The Hunger Games is very liberty oriented, of course, because that's a society that's gone way beyond what I dreamed up for Counteract. And I did not read The Hunger Games until after Counteract was already at the printer. Um, because I didn't want to be influenced. And, but with the Hunger Games, of course, as in retribution for a, a revolution against the government, that the tributes are taken from each sector every year and, and forced to fight to the death and with only one remaining. And, and of course, we think that's the kind of thing that could never happen. But, you know, does anyone stand up and does anyone say enough, no? And then as the series progresses, a, a, re, a, re, a rebellion does occur. So. Um, you know, being anti-government. See, that's the thing is the freedom stuff, it's almost kind of flipped its orientation since I was in school. I think um, I wrote a blog post once called The Year of My Dystopia, and that was my first year in junior high, and I'd been reading Nancy Drew's and, you know, Babysitter's Club and stuff like that. And then I go to junior high, and I'm taking the advanced English class, and we read pretty much every classic dystopian novel, you know, 1984. Fahrenheit 451, we saw on the beach and fail safe. And, uh, you know, and I was, my world was rocked, basically. Like, what the heck? You know, I had never, I'd never been allowed to watch scary movies. And all these things just were like, wow, it was too much. And so then you kind of wonder, but who was feeding me this information? My English teachers were, I mean, one guy carried a purse. <laughs> They were, they were hippies. They were the don't trust anyone under 30, over 30 generation, you know, and so they were the, they were the lefties at the time, and they were feeding me all this anti-government stuff. Now, what, what they say is, you know, submit to authority without question instead of question authority. And so I think the dystopia has flipped in the last generation or two. How old am I? Yeah. But anyway. Um, <laughs> That's, I thought that was a really interesting phenomenon because anti-authoritarianism, you know, is something that people who are not necessarily freedom-minded can also embrace. Like, when, if you look at the film 2081, um, the, uh, the Harrison Bergeron, the, the Kurt Vonnegut short story, you familiar with that one? Um, where everybody's made equal? Yes, yes, nodding head, yes, yes. And so 2081 is a short yeah. but it's, um, you know, the idea that the uh, United States Handicapper General has finally succeeded in making everyone equal. And there's a short film that was made, I forget how many years ago it was, but not too long ago. It has um, Julie Haggerty and, and a couple other people you'll recognize in it. And, uh, but, you know, Kurt Vonnegut wrote it as a socialist. And a lot of people don't know that. It's kind of read and interpreted as a freedom kind of a thing. And if you're liberty-minded and you read it, you're not going to draw any other conclusion. So sometimes the writer's intent isn't even, you know, it doesn't even figure in because when you read it with your own philosophy behind it, you're going to interpret it as you wish. Um, 
so. Uh, thinking about that, like thinking about writers who uh, have presented these powerful anti-authoritarian works and yet um, are coming at it very often with a, with a, a collectivist philosophy of their own, um, really makes me wonder about how those people reconcile those problems, that, that opposition in their mind. And uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, Mr. Medina asks uh, that he, he reminds us that you asked earlier, kind of you asked a rhetorical question, Tracy, uh, why, why do people allow tyranny to exist in their midst? Why do their people allow this kind of thing to happen? And he wonders if you actually have a qu any kind of an answer to that perennial question. I do. I have from Herman Goering that will give us the answer. And Herman Goering, I'm going to have to paraphrase because I don't have it in front of me, but I had this poster of Herman Goering on my wall when I, in my office when I wrote Counteract, and he says, naturally, the common people do not want war. They do not want it in America. They do not want it in England. But bringing them around to the thinking of their leaders is simple. All you have to do is tell them that they're being threatened and then ostracize the ones who fight against it as being unpatriotic. And I kept that in mind while I was writing Counteract. Okay, and so this was one of the head Nazis that said this. And I think it was kind of scary that, you know, whoever's in charge in the government, just they, they can use that no matter what side of the coin they're on. Uh, that's a great, concise answer. Um, I've got another uh, one from uh, Frank Morkopoulos, and this kind, kind of connects to what, again, you were saying about uh, leftist authors and anti-authoritarian writing. Frank asks, uh, do you think your stories can be effective in convincing lefto lefties to come over to the libertarian cause? Wow. Um, I'm not sure. I, I hoped that I would um, present you know, this view in, in a non-threatening and entertaining way just to make people think. And I don't know that I'll convert anyone. I have one dear friend who the only reason she and I have remained friends for 30 odd years is that we don't talk politics. And she came back to me at one point after I was posting some stuff on Facebook related to my book and she said, Tracy, do you really think that's wise? Do you really think you'll sell any copies of your book if you come out as being a crazy libertarian? And I just kind of was like, yeah, yeah. Actually, I hope so. And, um, <laughs> but I don't know if I'll change the world. I might, uh, open some people's eyes and make them think a little bit more. I don't know if I can uh, convert the masses with this, though. Well, we certainly hope you can. And you're, you're flowing directly into Frank's uh, final, I've got a third question for Frank, and you're flowing right into it. He asks, uh, what kinds of marketing initiatives, this is kind of a more like a publishing question, uh, what kinds of marketing initiatives are you undertaking to help push the, your book to a wider audience? Okay, well, this was huge on my list was coming here and talking to you all at Liberty V. I was so excited to do this. Um, well, as an independent publisher, you know, I'm, I'm traditionally published with a small press. And so my publisher, um, she manages about, what, 10 authors maybe? And she's, she's got a lot of uh, books in the air, we'll say, you know, trying to promote all of us and work with all of us and bring out our new work. So um, we put together a blog tour, a virtual book tour, if you will, instead of me hitting the road, I, I hit a series of blogs. So it was 10 days of blogging, and it was very fun. And I, I found different bloggers who, you know, were young adult bloggers or were friends of mine, and they um, hosted, re they did posted reviews or author spotlights, excerpts from the book, and then we tweeted the heck out of it and put it out on our social media. Okay, so, <laughs> and then after that died down, then there were a couple live book signings. We had a release party here in Dallas. Um, which was really a lot of fun. It, the release date happened to be my birthday as well, and I was very excited because it made turning 29 again so much easier. And so, but then after, the, okay, after the initial furor dies down, then you think, how can I cross promote? What can I do? Um, well, I blog, I tweet, I'm on Facebook all the time, and I'm making connections with other blogs soliciting more reviews. Um, my publisher's been responsible for getting me a, a national radio program and um, several reviews 
through different blogs and things like that, but reviews on Amazon.com really do help. Um, right now, I that nucleus of people that know me, I, I, I always am doing this when I'm talking about it, is that, that circle of people that know me and you know are going to buy the book because, oh, Tracy's my friend, or Tracy, I went to school with Tracy, I'll buy a book from her. I need to get outside that circle. And that's the rub, is how do you get outside that circle? So doing programs where people don't know me and um, you know things like that. But yeah, I'm, I'm doing several live events in Dallas. And I don't know too many people here yet. I've only lived here a year. But when I was in Ohio, I started hitting the high schools and solicit and just cold calling high schools and saying, do you have a teacher, an English teacher, a creative writing class? Can I come in and talk about writing and publishing? And so I've been making contact with a lot of different schools that way. And I find that that's very gratifying. Even if I don't sell a ton of books while I'm there, it's, ex it's, it's really, really fun to talk to the kids. And so I'm hoping that just it will just continue to grow. I also sell them out of the trunk of my car. <laughs> I, I, I'm never you, that one. You, you keep a supply in the, in the trunk. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. That was advice from my first publisher, the, the nonfiction book. He said, don't ever leave home without a couple copies in the trunk of your car. And it's proven to be very true. So yeah. You have to be relentless. I think if I were in uh, Divergent, they have the five factions. You have to uh, choose your faction when you're 16. And there's Amity and Erudite and um, you know Dauntless. And they've all got different characteristics that suit them for their faction. Uh, if there were a faction called Relentless, that would be the one I would be in because I feel like I've been relentless trying to market this book. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah, I mean, um, you hear a lot of authors talking about doing a blog tour, video program, um, but I've never heard anybody go into high schools. That's genius. Um. <laughs> oh, hey, you know, you know the really good one. Okay, this is coming up. Um, a sorority sister of mine who was a journalism major at Ohio University. Where? Oh, you, oh, you, yeah. And, um, but she, she said she's in charge of the silent auction at her kid's school, and she's always looking for something interesting to auction off. And she said, tell me if this is too crazy or if you're down with it. She said, would you be willing to auction off the right to name a character in your third book? I know, right? I think I thought it was genius. So I was like, absolutely. So she got me book signings, at, or she got me talks at three high schools in Cleveland for the end of this month, and then I'll be meeting um, with the kids parents at the elementary school and, and, you know, hype for the book and, and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm donating a signed copy of Counteract to the auction and then uh, she says, I'll make sure they bid high to name a character in the third book. And I've actually got an unnamed character in the first scene of the third book, so he might get a name pretty quickly. <laughs> That's a pretty cool way to do things. Uh, I thought she was, I, I, she was thinking outside the box there. Yeah, yeah, um, and so that's several different, like you're not just pursuing all the the new traditional angles of uh, marketing online, blog, social media, and so on, but then also these these newer, like experimental marketing programs. Yes, <laughs> yes, and uh, you know, the, the high school stuff has been interesting and fun, and um, one of the classes I had at a high school in Columbus, I had a super day there. I talked to seven classes, and this one class, was full of big football player looking guys, you know, big tough looking guys. And they came in and they sat down. This was, you know, English 11. It wasn't AP English 11. It was just, you know, regular old English 11. And they came in. They had not been warned ahead of time that they were having this author lady come talk to them. And I gave my spiel. I say, any questions? And it's like cricket. And so I said, oh, well then, since we've got a little time left, why don't I read to you from the first chapter of the book? And so I open the book, and as I open the book, all their heads start to go down on the table. And I thought, huh, I'm losing them all. They're taking a nap. But when I, they sat up, and the biggest one in the room raises his hand, and he said, ma'am, could I have your autograph? And I had them all. And I said, absolutely. And I had handed out business cards to them all with promo information on about the book. And as I was walking down the aisle, to sign his card, every single kid in that aisle was pushing their card across the table toward me. And I signed every card in the room. And it was like, you know, I didn't care that I didn't sell a book in that class because it was that, that moment of connecting with those kids. It was priceless. And so I can, you know, 
at changing the world one high school class at a time. Yeah, yeah, and then like back to that sense of making connections, changing the world, inspiring people. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker uh, writes uh, that he can testify. He says, I can testify that your book has given me plenty of material for speeches. And sometimes I think oh, that good. fiction is better than nonfiction uh, to make the core point. And he, he reminds us there's a reason why Atlas, consider, uh, Atlas Shrugged continues to be the inspiration behind, behind so much liberty thinking. Absolutely. Well, I read not too long ago that 70% um, of the words of Jesus Christ in the Bible are in the form of parables. And you have to, you know, you can't, you can't argue that the, the man was one of the best public speakers ever, right? And he chose the parable as the way to get his point across. And so, yes, I think we can reach um, pretty much, you, know, you reach your audience with fiction a whole lot more effectively. And Jeff, thanks for, thanks for using my stuff. That's awesome. And now, if only the state would stop. Yeah, well, yeah, me material too. So. I wrote the second book during the government shutdown, so uh, there's all kinds of fun stuff in there. A symbiotic no relationship. Problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's I was actually writing, what I, I, what I, I wanted wonder, to ask. I, I, I thought I wondered if people would recognize that I had written the second book during the government mm -hmm. shutdown because it was just so <laughs> frustrating and, you know, so I was slamming here and slamming there. So. Uh, so speaking of the writing, that's what I want to know about, uh, kind of to, to round up, I want to know what's happening in the rest of the series. So the second book is coming out in 2015. Is the third book already written? Are you one of these people that has it all done? Wow. Oh, no, gosh. Um, the third book is, the third book is right, right beside me, actually. There's a big pile of papers that's the third book. It's um, kind of having to be the, the thing that waits while I promote the first book. And I'm, you know, doing some other gigs on the side and everything. And um, but while I'm, you know, when I get back to the third book, I have a pretty good idea of where it's going. The third book, and it started out as a trilogy. We were calling it a trilogy, and then right before the book went to press, my publisher changed it to the Resistance series. And I'm hoping that's because she kind of thought, ah, if she wants to do more than three, I'm down with that because I do have, um, you know, the three books are, are in the contract right now. So, but. The third book has kind of become like that ever-expanding salad that you buy you know, at a restaurant. You, know, you sit down, you start to eat, and you look down halfway through the meal, and it's bigger than when you started. And so I think that that's kind of what's happened to the third book right now, and it may turn into a fourth book. We'll see. But yes, I am, I am writing. Um, I know where it's going. There's all kinds of fun things that I try to carry forward from book to book, and continuity, and um, I think my publisher was about ready to kill me at the end. She finally said, I'm taking the book and you are not making any more changes. Because as I wrote the second book, I kept going, I need to go back and I just need to add a paragraph or a page. And, and she was like, okay, stop. So I'm, I'm hanging on to the second one until I'm pretty far into the third one so I don't have to do that to her again. But yeah, the, the second one's ready to go. Except for continuity wow, that's issues. <laughs> continuity issues. You just have to issue a revised version of the first book. Oh no, no revised. <laughs> I, I hope that once it's out, it's out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Tracy, for this uh, peek at the book, at Counteract itself and the beginning of the Resistance series, and also at the thinking behind it and um, bringing together a lot of threads in terms of other pieces of dystopian fiction and how they fit into your writing and into Liberty Thing in general. Um, so I'm going to wrap up, and the wrap up takes a little while. So first, I'm going to tell people a little bit uh, about some more great Liberty.me live events we have coming up. Then I'm going to give people a few links uh, to resources for Counteract and more Tracy Lawson in general. Some of the same links that are on there on that page, but I think I have I have a, uh, some extra stuff as well. And uh, then okay. I'll turn it back to you, Tracy, and I'll give you the last word. Okay. <laughs> right. So uh, this is uh, I don't know if you. Well, Tracy was here for our class on sci-fi economics on Monday night. It was great to have you in. Um, and this is actually the third, this class right now is actually the third science fiction and liberty class we've had in the last two weeks. Uh, we had sci-fi economics uh, on Monday, and then before that uh, we had uh, a Mike DiBaggio and Shell DiBaggio talk about their series, uh, The Ascension Epoch. 
and their book specifically, uh, House of Refuge. And so I want to tell people about the second installment. They were keep, kind of keeping going with the sci-fi liberty theme. And we have a second installment of the sci-fi economics class next Monday. And that's with Lucas Engelhart once again. And here's the link. You can, guys can go and sign up for that one. Um, tomorrow, we actually uh, have three classes tomorrow. Um, we've got Liberty Live with uh, Jeffrey Tucker. This is his fourth episode in, on the man of the century. That's Ludwig von Mises, of course, and his works. Um, then uh, later in the day around, that's it. Uh, sorry, Jeffrey Tucker's class is at 2.30 Eastern Time. Uh, around 8 o'clock Eastern Time, we've got uh, the third episode of G.P. Manish's uh, work on economic calculation and socialism in both theory and practice. And then finally, later in the evening at 9.30 Eastern Time, we've got Zach Slayback coming uh, back for his uh, moral psychology lecture. This is episode three of Love, Hate, and the State. Uh, okay, so those are all uh, Liberty.me Live things that are coming up soon. Now I want to tell you guys a little more about getting Tracy Lawson stuff. This is one you can already see the link in kind of small on the PowerPoint, but here it is in the chat. Uh, this is the website for the book itself, counteract.com. And here is a great place. Pardon me? The, the link down here, it says counteract.com. It's counteractbook.com. Uh-oh. So, uh, yeah. Counteractbook.com. Thank you. Um, yes, and, sir. There you go. OK, great. And then the, uh, the place you can go to buy the book, the Kindle edition or a physical book edition, and uh, importantly for Tracy's career to leave a review, is here on Amazon. <laughs> and Tracy mentioned working with a small publisher, and I want to let you guys know how to get a hold of more wonderful books like Tracy's, and that's Budapus Inc. There, Inc. with a K, not Inc. with a C. And then uh, finally, if you want to follow uh, on Twitter, the series itself has its own Twitter handle, uh, Tommy and Kareen. It's named after the main characters in uh, Counteract. There we go. So uh, that's, uh, that's are some great resources for getting more Tracy Lawson, more from the Resistance series. Uh, it's been wonderful having you, Tracy. Thanks so much for coming and spending the hour with us. Um, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to you now to give the last word. A little plug. Ah, oh, there it is. There it is. OK. No, my last little plug is just to think how we can use fiction to you know, keep bad things from happening. And, because dystopia is about, can human nature be changed in such a way that man will forget his longing for freedom, his longing for dignity, or for integrity, or for love? And I think in all the dystopian fiction, the answer is always no. You cannot structure society to take the human part away from people, because they will rebel. And so that's, that's the, th the thought I'd like to leave us with tonight, is that you know, we're going to keep writing dystopian fiction so it stays fiction. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tracy. Everyone have a lovely evening. Thanks for joining us on Liberty.me Live. Okay. All right. Oh. Well, I think I'll be uh, famous for taking a shot.